Finally, 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 here we are with our very first episode on my channel. My name is Yemu Matibe. I am a singer, singing teacher, and a music enthusiast. And I can't wait for you to embark on this incredible journey of just discovering all the amazing vocal music from Africa and beyond. So, without much talking, let's dive into it. Grab a snack, grab a drink, and we're going to get into it now. <laughs> I think many of us believe singing is natural, since it is an instrument that is a part of us, and we are practically singing from an early age without guidance. Being African, singing informs very much a part of our cultural traditions and daily life. So I was immersed into a soundscape of singing through school, home, church, radio, TV. It's only when I became a teacher, I was confronted by the question regarding the validity of singing lessons. Since singing constitutes the human daily experiences, do we actually need singing lessons or are we naturals? So in order to understand the value of singing lessons, it is important to understand the history of vocal pedagogy. Fancy words, right? But actually, it's proof that there is a whole field dedicated to documenting the evolution, development of teaching singing, as well as encouraging room for growth and innovation where technique is concerned. So, let's start at the very beginning. So what does pedagogy mean to begin with? According to the Cambridge Dictionary, pedagogy is defined as the study of the methods and activities of teaching. So in other words, vocal pedagogy looks at the nitty gritties of teaching singing. In fact, there are several ways vocal pedagogy has been defined that sheds more light on this. I quite like the one that I found in Deidre Rautenbach's thesis. She cites two leading voices in the discipline, Paul Kitchen and Clifton Way, which I feel clarify what vocal pedagogy is. She states, Kitchen shares the opinion that vocal pedagogy is both art and science and concludes that it consists of scientifically based discussions focusing on the working of the voice combined with the application of that information to improve singing. Ware defines vocal pedagogy as a process of training by means of a prescribed course of study, including a combination of principles, rules and procedures relating to the development, exercise and practice of the art of singing. Essentially, these definitions point to the fact that singing goes beyond just the actual act of singing. There are methods and practices involved, supported by empirical evidence, all of which ensure that a student reaches their maximum capacity as a singer. Recently, the definition has broadened to include a more holistic view of vocal pedagogy. This notion has been popularized by Karen Sull in her book, The Disciplines of Vocal Pedagogy, towards an holistic approach. She identifies the multiple disciplines within the vocal pedagogy and how their amalgamation into one single study will enhance the singer. But it only pertains to classical singing. So to sum it up, there is a whole field dedicated to teaching singing guided by scientific evidence, right? Suddenly this makes singing look more complicated than it really is. Okay, let's not get sidetracked. The definition is out of the way. Now let's look at the historical development of the field. It will be brief, I promise. So, as far back as the 7th century in Rome, from the church among the Scuola Cantorum, those were the Gregorian chant choirs. These monks aimed to not only teach singing, but to equip liturgic singers to teach others through the rigorous study of the human voice. Thanks to them, they paved the way for the old Italian school of singing as well as setting up the foundations of vocal technique which we know today. Before 1800, voice teaching was largely an oral tradition with a paucity of substantial written works on actual vocal teaching. The earliest traces of singing teaching literature did not go into much depth about the methods and practices, therefore providing very little understanding. 
during the Baroque period through to the Classical period, literature on complete vocal method began to surface owing to the changing landscape for singers. Moving from the group choral context like we saw in the choirs, vocal music continued to develop through oratorio and opera, where singers began to move towards solo singing which demanded more from them. We see this expressed through displays of agility and improvised ornamentation common to the style. The development of instruments would also influence vocal music, as soloists needed reliable technique to compete with chamber ensembles and orchestras. It is argued Lodovico Zacconi and Giulio Caccini had released the first writings on singing in 1592 and 1602 respectively, but these works merely provided limited instruction on actual singing. Both offered instruction on general aspects of musicality as a singer, with emphasis on ornamentation, which was common to the style. So some argue that the first actual treatise or writing of vocal pedagogy is credited to Pier Francesco Tosi, Opinioni di Cantori Antichi e Mordeni in 1723. Let's move on to the Romantic period where we see the popularization of the bel canto style of singing which influenced a whole national singing style in Italy, but it also allowed for the emergence of many formal and key texts for vocal teachers even today. A quote taken from an article, Formation and Development of the Italian Vocal School from 16th to 19th centuries by Martinova and, and a, a few other authors states, the first third of the 19th century was the era of developed Balcanto. If in the 18th century, the main task of Belcanto singing was virtuosity, then the beginning of the 19th century foreshadowed the search for other methods of singing, contributing to the expression of more individualized feelings and characters, the lyric and dramatic nature of a pratic action. Such singing required a variety, a quick change of dynamic and dramatic shades that could not be realized with the help of only virtuosity and an abundance of coloratura which was very prominent in the Baroque period through to the Classical period. During this time, opera developed a more powerful way of singing, unlike the lighter, agile voices of preceding eras, as well as an extension of the range at large. The orchestra increased in size as operas now took place in bigger venues, making powerful singing very much a necessity. Opera's increasing popularity spread throughout Europe, resulting in national schools of singing in other countries, namely Germany, France, and England, each developing their own national styles of singing based on their approach of certain elements like breath management, phonation, and vowel modification. During this period and beyond the contributions of Manuel Garcia II and Louis Mandel, in tandem with other 19th century pedagogues, they encouraged the incorporation discussions, as well as the writings relating to the anatomy and physiology of the voice within singing teaching. Fundamentally, they provided the scientific underpinning that would be later adopted and formalized by pedagogues in the 20th and 21st centuries. Moreover, modern pedagogues like Richard Miller outlined the importance of maintaining a balance between the art and the science of the discipline. So, here are some of the key figures in vocal pedagogy from the beginning till now, and some of their works are still used to this day. So we can see the history of vocal pedagogy going back really far back in history. But there is the obvious elephant in the room. It is deeply rooted in Western classical singing teaching. Problematic, maybe, but here's the good news. Pedagogies on other modern vocal styles have developed namely jazz and contemporary commercial music, singing styles, to account for this gap. Let's have a look at some of the more modern styles. Some notable jazz vocal pedagogues include Michelle Weir, Bob Stoloff, Stephen Zagree, Scott Binnick. In the contemporary commercial music genre, we have Jeannie Lovetri, Matthew Hoke, and Anne Pickham, just to name a few. And in Africa, we also have our own pedagogues with extensive performance careers, as well as the contribution as lecturers. 
just as a side note, I'm not familiar with all vocal pedagogues in Africa. And since I'm from Southern Africa, I decided to list those from within the region that I've either encountered personally or through research. So those of you from other parts of Africa, please feel free to DM me in the direction of other pedagogues and singers because it would be very interesting to know of many other pedagogues. So it is clear we owe much of what we see now in voice teaching to the classical pedagogues who laid the necessary foundations for the modern ones, who in turn have developed pedagogies which account for the modern styles. So that is a very brief and simplistic version of the context of singing teaching.